All right, guys, welcome to RC Mojo. We've been working on the tank for a few episodes in a row now, so I think it's about time we did something different. So this week, we're going to make a start on the mods on the Flysky 9X transmitter. We've got a couple of bits to add. First is a white backlight. You get a thin foam pad to replace a thicker one to allow for the extra space the backlight takes up. For a basic install, it doesn't need any soldering. It just plugs into an existing connector. Second is a centering lever for the left stick. Flysky don't supply them as a spare part, so RC Tanks Australia sell this rather nice 3D printed one. They do free shipping, so it only costs about a fiver to get one in the UK. Third, we have a USB ASP programmer. These are ridiculously cheap. I normally use a AVR ISP Mark II, which costs about 35 quid. The USB ASP knockoffs can be had for about three quid. And for what we need to do on the radio, it will do the job perfectly. There's already loads of guides around for the 9X. So many, there's a good chance of information overload. Not to mention, there's some conflicting information while hopping blog to blog. Right then, I think we're going to start with a backlight. The battery needs to come out, along with the six screws that hold the case together. The screws are self-tappers and appear to be quite soft metal, so be careful not to slip and strip the heads. Very carefully lift the back off. Don't just yank it off, as you'll probably break something. The only connection between the halves is the large connector on the mainboard. For easy access, we may as well unplug it. Next, we need to remove the mainboard from the case. It's held in with a whole load of small self-tappers. When they're all out, carefully jiggle the board and gently lift it until it's free. Then hinge it back, being careful with the LCD flat flex. We need to replace the foam pad with a thinner bit from the kit. Peel it off, being careful to try and get it all off in one piece. Don't worry too much about the backing being left on the PCB. As long as there's no big lumpy bits, it will be good enough. The new bit of foam is quite a bit thinner than the stock one. If we compare the thin bit and the backlight with the stock one, the thickness is pretty close. It will be a little bit tighter, but good enough. The PCB has a nice LCD outline on the silk screen, so positioning is easy. Peel off the backing and stick it down nice and centrally. Simple. The LCD has a silver backing which looks quite opaque, but surprisingly it's more transparent than it looks. So there's nothing else we need to do. The backlight sits on the back of the LCD with the wires on the right. Route the wires to clear the D-pad buttons and run it up behind the PCB. Carefully pop the PCB back in, being careful not to trap any wires. Check the front. There should be no sign of the backlight. It should look exactly the same as stock. If it's all nicely aligned, pop a couple of the screws back in to stop the PCB falling out. Disconnect the white connector to the right of the LCD connector and plug in the backlight. The wires going to the backlight could do with being a tiny bit longer, but if you fiddle around it will all sit in there quite nicely. Next, we can install the self-centering lever. It's simple enough, it just presses onto the metal pin on the stick assembly and hinges down. If it doesn't fit over the pin, you might need to pass a drill through it to clear out the hole. But don't make the hole too big. We don't need a friction plate anymore. Its two screws can come out and the plate put somewhere safe in case we want to put it back to stock. All we need now is a spring. I've read that some revisions of the Heng Long transmitter have some springs in that we can use. Let's have a look. Batteries out, remove the four screws and lift off the back. To get the stick assemblies out, there's three silver screws. The sticks unplug, which leaves us with what looks a lot like a game console gamepad style joystick assembly. Neat, but these won't have the type of spring we need for the 9X. Now, because I've been doing RC for a little while, I've got a horde of old radios, and it just so happens that this two-channel Futaba has a conventional stick with the spring that we need. It's not too difficult to fish out with some tweezers, you just have to be careful not to slip and ping it across the room. The spring is a simple extension spring with looped ends. They should be available somewhere on eBay, costing next to nothing, if you don't have anything to borrow parts from. The spring just needs to hook over a lug on the stick assembly, then over the end of the centering lever, pulling it closed. So we can test it, we need to refit the back of the case. The large connector plugs back in, close up the radio, and fit a couple of screws to hold it all together. By partially rebuilding the radio, we make sure we can't accidentally short something when we plug the battery back in. Right, let's turn it on. Well, that's a bit blue. 
Assuming the backlight is indeed white, that must be the silver coating on the LCD. The main thing though, we can actually see what's on the display. It's so much better, it's actually usable now. Nice! Now then, we know it's all working, we can take the back off again and refit the rest of the screws on the PCB. Next, we're going to have a look at changing the firmware. This is of course optional, the stock firmware is quite adequate for running a tank, but the likes of ER9X and OpenTX open a huge number of possibilities for configuring the transmitter. There's a few steps to get the firmware on. The first is we need to be able to connect our USB ASP to the processor in the radio. We'll need to fit a 10-pin IDC connector and wire it up to the mainboard. If you take a close look at the PCB around the processor, you can see lots of little round pads. These are test points used during manufacture of the radio. When they program the chip, they will use a bed of nails with lots of little pogo pins like this one. If you don't like soldering, Smarty Parts do a nice little board that uses short pogo pins to make a solderless connection. Okay, here's the IDC socket. You can solder directly to the pins just fine, but it's better to have something to tie them all together. A little bit of strip board is ideal, and available from the likes of Maplin. At this stage, we're not worried about where the pins connect to, we just need to mark pin 1, which has a nice little triangular marker. Pin 2 is the next one across, then 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 in the bottom corner, and 10 in the bottom left. The ribbon cable we're using has a red wire at one end, this is pin 1, which, not surprisingly, connects to pin 1 on the connector. What we end up with is all the odd pins on one side and the even pins on the other. Solder it up and we've got a nice sturdy connector ready to fit. I want to have the connector where the Flysky logo is so the ribbon needs to run down the middle of the radio. We can trim off the excess making sure it's just a bit longer than we actually need. Here's the pin out of the connector. There's not many connections to make, most of them are grounds which all connect together. Pin 1 is MOSI which is a data connection. Pin 2 is VCC, which is 5 volts from the USB ASP. Pin 3 isn't actually connected to anything at all. Pins 4, 6, 8 and 10 are all ground. Uh, pin 5 is a reset, so the programmer can reset the processor. Pin 7 is the serial clock. And pin 9 is MISO, the other data pin. But you really don't need to know what the pins actually do, as long as you connect them to the right pads on the board. Start with a red wire on the ribbon, which is pin 1, and work your way through the wires. If you break it all down and go step by step, it's pretty straightforward getting it all connected up. Next, we need to mount up the connector. I got an idea for mounting it up behind the logo from an article I found looking for info about the mods. Trouble is, I can't find it now, but if I do come across it, I'll stick a link down in the description. The Flysky logo, or Turner G, or whatever logo you have, is easy to peel off. Get a knife under one edge and work your way across. It leaves us with a nice spot for the connector. We can draw around the socket, giving us a rough shape for the hole. Then a quick buzz with a Dremel, and we've got ourselves somewhere for the connector, which can just slot in, being nice and level with the case. To hold it in, we could make some sort of mount, but it's easier just to squirt in some hot glue. A good blob at the top, and two blobs in the bottom corners, being careful not to let any glue get to the pins. Once it's cooled down and gone nice and solid, we can pop the logo back on, and no one would be any the wiser it's been modded. Nice. The radio can go back together, big connector back in, close it up, and refit the six screws. And that's where all the hardware mods stop. Which brings us to the really fun bit, getting the firmware changed. I'm going to be using a Mac, it's pretty similar on a Linux system too. On Windows it's a bit different, but there's loads of Windows based guides if you need to fill in any gaps. If you go to er9x.com, there's a load of files listed. The one we want is EP for Mac. Click it and it will download a disk image. We don't need anything else from here. The EP software will manage the firmware files for us, more or less. Installing EP is just like installing most programs on a Mac. Open up the image and drag and drop the program in your applications. The program isn't signed, so Gatekeeper will complain if you try and run it. If you open your applications in the Finder, right-click EP and select Open, then click Open in the dialog box, it will bypass Gatekeeper and EP will run. EP will ask if you want to download the latest firmware, just click No. Then it will ask if you want to ignore the firmware altogether, click No. 
Now we've got the release notes, which I'm sure are really interesting to read, but I will click Don't Show Again and click on OK. Right, here we have EP in all its glory. First we need to check the preferences and download some firmware. You could change the channel order and mode, but rudder, elevator, throttle, aileron and mode 2 will do us just fine. For our radio we want the straight ER9X version. We've got an 80 Mega 64, so we want M64. Not sure what EEPROM version is. I guess it's got to do with how the firmware stores models in the EEPROM for backwards compatibility. Maybe. Now we can click on download, which will open a save dialog. We need somewhere to store some files, so I'm going to make a folder called EP and a folder called firmware, which is where I'll save the files. I've not got the radio connected yet, but we're going to click the flash firmware button and select the hex file we just downloaded. It'll ask if we want to write to flash, which we do. Then, unless you're already doing things with AVR processors, it will tell us it can't find AVR dude. The Windows version of EP comes with AVR dude bundled, but on Mac OS we need to install it ourselves. AVR dude is a little program that handles the actual flashing of the processor. Unfortunately it's not a drag and drop type install though, we're going to need to do a bit in the command line. First we need a package manager, which is kind of like an app store for the command line. There's a couple around for Mac OS, but I'm a big fan of Homebrew. It's easy to install and more or less does all the setting up all by itself. First we need to go to brew.sh, where we find a little string we need to copy to the clipboard. Next we bring up the terminal program and paste in the command. All it does is run the brew install script, and you always get the latest version. Hit enter and macOS will pop up a window saying a command isn't found. Essentially, brew needs some developer tools to compile programs for us. Click install and then click agree. What's hard to see is behind the dialog box is a little pop-up that for whatever reason is hidden. Hit enter and it will clear letting the tools install. When it's done, click done. Back to the terminal, we want to continue, so hit the return key. Brew needs permission to install itself, so enter your user password and hit enter. Brew will now download and install all the bits it needs. It's not very big, so it's not going to take very long. Now we've got ourselves a package manager, we can install AVRDude. The command is pretty simple. Brew install AVRDude dash dash with dash USB. If you break it down, it's pretty obvious what it's doing. We're telling Brew to install AVR Dude with USB support. Hit enter and Brew will go off and sort everything out it needs to get AVR Dude running. When it's done, we can run AVR Dude just by typing AVR Dude and hitting enter. It should spew out a load of help text with the last line containing the version. If you get something like this, AVR Dude is ready to go. Back to EP now, if we do flash firmware again, open the hex file and say yes to flash memory, you'll get a window with the output from AVR Dude. It says it can't find a USB device, which is exactly what we would expect as it's not connected. Now we've got the Mac software ready, we can plug in the radio. We don't need a battery for this, the USB ASP will supply the 5 volts. It's tempting just to go and flash the ER9X firmware, but for safety it's a good idea to back up the stock firmware first. Click the read firmware button and make a backup folder. Call the file something sensible like fw and hit save. AVR dude will spring into action and load the stock firmware from the processor. It will take a little while as the communication is fairly slow. The processor has another type of memory called EEPROM which stores the model memories and we might as well back this up too. There's no button for this, so you have to go into the burn menu and click read EEPROM memory to file. Give the file a sensible name like EE and hit save. This one's a bit quicker as there's a lot less data. Ok, now we've got a backup. If anything goes wrong or we don't like the new firmware, we can always go back to the way it was. Right, the moment we've been waiting for, it's time to flash with ER9X. Click the flash firmware button, find the ER9X hex file we downloaded earlier, and click open. Yes to write to flash memory. EEP will make a temporary backup of the EEPROM, clear the flash memory, write the new firmware, and then read it back to check it's all correct. And there we go, the radio now has the ER9X firmware. We can unplug the transmitter, pop in the battery, and turn it on. 
Okay, the first thing we see is an EEPROM error, which makes perfect sense. The contents of the EEPROM will still be set up for the stock firmware, or perhaps blank. We can press any button to clear the error and let the firmware set itself up. Right, now we've got lots of switch alerts, so we're going to need to disable those. But here we go, we're in. Nice. <laughs> Looks like the sticks need calibrating, which should be easy enough. Hold menu to get the menu up. Select radio setup and hit menu again. Down to calibration and hit menu again. Menu to start. Okay, it wants the center points, so we'll make sure everything is in its center position. Menu again. Now we move all the sticks to the corners and the knobs end to end. Much like the old game controller calibration in Windows. Menu again to save it. Then exit until we're back to the main screen. And the little circles are now bang on in the center. Nice. The menu system seems to be fairly well laid out. There's absolutely loads you can fiddle with in the setups. If you go back to er9x.com there's a PDF manual that covers it all. Some things are a little bit different to usual radio setups, but it does make for a very powerful and flexible system. I've set up a basic model for the tank, with the controls mapped to the sticks. The engine start and machine gun channel is now on the 3 position switch, which wasn't possible with the stock firmware. No doubt I've missed a few bits, but it should be good enough for a test. I'll leave the video running in the background. Right, well that's it for this week. We got quite a bit done. Next tank video I think we'll be looking at making the turret controls proportional, which should be fun. So, as always, thanks so much for watching. I hope you liked it. Uh, if you watched all of it, I should hope it was at least useful. If it was, do please hit the like button. And if you're not already, why not subscribe? It's free, you know. Bye, guys.